Hi, everyone. Welcome back for another Two Bottle Tasting Series here at WineSpectatorTastings.com. Um, we've got an awesome, fun one today. We Carlotta Wines, and we're going to start with their Pinot Grigio and then move on to a property that they own in Napa Valley called Chimney Rock and taste one of their Cabernets from the very famous and very delicious Stag Leap region of Napa. So, Travis, this is kind of interesting. We normally, like, we talk about one specific winery. We talk about one specific region. What's the thread that connects these today? Yeah, well, what unites these two wines is, is a man, actually, and really a pioneer in the wine industry in America, a man named Tony Turlato, uh, who came from uh, humble beginnings as a, a, a young boy, really, working in his parents' uh, wine shop in Chicago, and then over the decades went on to transform the wine industry in America, focusing on uh, high-quality wines, imports, and really forging important partnerships with restaurants and cultivating restaurant wine programs in the United States. And so uh, that's the thread that, that connects these two exciting wines and uh, I'm excited to, to go through and taste their differences and really be able to celebrate Tony. Um, for some of our viewers may know that unfortunately, Tony just passed away uh, in June, 2020. So we're honoring his memory here and so excited to, uh, to taste what the company is doing now. Yeah, it's, um, it's, to me, I've always said wine is one of the last really great multi-billion global industries that's still connected by people and in some ways like um you know watching hamilton again and kind of think of like the founding fathers and how there's individuals that impacted our country i look back and look at wine in the u.s and there's definitely this small little group kind of like our founding fathers of wine and like seeing tony's story and hearing about like he was the first guy to import frank schumacher's wines alexis lachine's wines seeing photos of him and Robert Mondavi, you know, in 69, sharing a table and bringing Mondavi's wines to Chicago. And it's just crazy to think about how far the U.S. has come as a wine drinking country. And it really was some pioneers that kind of helped spread that culture of wine should be enjoyed. It should be, you know, shared with families and friends. And it's not this elite beverage. And to me, kind of a perfect segue is into Pinot Grigio because it's it's the ultimate white wine for the masses, and I mean that in the best possible way. Because, you know, Travis, what about summertime and Pinot Grigio for you? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And Tony was really responsible for introducing that grape to American wine drinkers. And for me, you know, at the time you had Americans who were beginning to become familiar with Chardonnay, right, or even some German wines that were a little sweeter at the time. For me, Pinot Grigio is one of those wines that does two things. First of all, it's subtle. Uh, it's, a, it's a great kind of blank canvas white wine in that it's very, very accessible and can go well with lots of different kinds of food. But because it's a little quieter and a little more subtle, I think there's, uh, there's a period in your, in your wine drinking journey where you come back to Pinot Grigio where you may have thought it as something sort of simple and quaffable and really begin to appreciate how subtle and how complex it can actually be. And so for me, Pinot Grigio is wonderful just by itself uh, you know on the porch on a hot summer day but it can actually go really brilliantly with again subtler cuisine so i'm thinking pastas that are dressed lightly with uh, cream sauces with poultry that's just been very very lightly seasoned with all kinds of crudités and vegetables pinot grigio can really shine in that way yeah and this one the terlato is from vineyards and Friuli, which is up in the northeast part of italy um, a lot of people kind of see that as like the benchmark area for crisp, clean, refreshing white wines. And a big part of that was just they were the first to kind of go all in on let's, you know, actually clean up fermentation, chill it down, get out of these old dirty barrels. Let's try some stainless steel and kind of have a modern white. And it worked out perfect because Italy itself, and I love it, they drink almost as much wine per capita as anyone in the world. Um, but unlike France, there's like zero pretentiousness about it. And like every meal you go to, there's wine served, and it's spectacular, and it's just something that's there to enjoy with food, and more times than not, Italian wines have this wonderful kind of crisp acidity and then a little bit of bitterness, and when I'm having food, it's like the perfect way to like end every bite, get me ready for another sip. And Pinot Grigio just is so good at doing that. Yeah, so for me, one of the first things I appreciate about fine Pinot Grigio is if you look at the color of it, it actually has a very slight brassiness to it. And for me, that's indicative of, of quality Pinot Grigio. It's showing a little bit of uh, potentially skin contact and a little bit of interaction with the lees or the yeast in the winery to, again, give it a little extra texture and to contribute some interesting subtle flavors. From the nose right away, it's uh, bursting with beautiful citrus uh, fruit notes, so lemon, 
uh, lots of yellow apple and yellow pear. But then there's some savory aspects to it as well. I touched on almond skin already. Uh, there's marzipan and even a little bit of a, a subtle kind of malted note, almost like a, a fine Pilsner beer. I know that sounds strange, but it's something I get a lot in Pinot Grigio. Just got that almost like biting into a key lime. You know, it's like sour, sweet, sour citrus. And very much like beer, what I love about Pinot Grigio is you, you don't have to think about it to understand it. It's just one of those things that chill it down, drink it, and next thing you know, the bottle's gone. And there's just something absolutely kind of Goldilocks about it where it's big enough to hang up, hang with a lot of foods like Chardonnay can, but it's also light enough that it will roll with the lighter foods. So, but it's not as the commitment that say a Sauvignon Blanc is because Sauvignon Blancs are just kind of loud. And there's just something about having this just super drinkable, great white wine that goes with almost anything and everything, especially summer. All right, so as we're trying to connect the dots here, and for me, wine is always about connecting the dots and stories, the people, um, the Tony Terlato story, father of Pinot Grigio, you know, how do we connect that to Chimney Rock? And we're really lucky because we got with us um, Elizabeth Vienna, who is the winemaker for Chimney Rock, and she's about to join us. So Elizabeth, please welcome to the show. We're thrilled to have you and excited to uh, taste your delicious wine. Hi, Keith. Hi, Travis. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's actually perfect timing because we just finished our harvest, so I'm a little bit calmer, and um, it feels nice to sit down and share a glass of wine with you both. Awesome. I'd have to imagine there's been a few beers consumed in the last week or two as well, or probably shot the whiskeys with the uh, all the stress and extra drama this season Absolutely. has brought. Now, growing up in Napa, I distinctly remember Chimney Rock first and foremost as like this amazing nine hole golf course. And when did the when did the golf course go away? And like now it's like I think that just blows people's minds like, wait, there used to be a golf course right there. And now it's some pretty amazing wines. Well originally it was actually an eighteen hole golf course and the first nine holes were pulled out um, when the first vines were planted back in the early eighties. Uh, and then when the Trilado family uh, became investors in the property, they pulled out the last nine holes. And I still find golf balls in our vineyard. So the spirit of golf <laughs> is on at Chimney Rock, but we make pretty good Cabernet, and it stags the district, so you can't go wrong there. Nice. Um, I, I might have lost one of those balls. That might have been mine. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I find if I bring, like, a ball for every hole, I usually can make it through the course. But anyways, we digress. Um, so how did you get to know Tony? And, you know, I, to me, it's, it's an interesting company because it has always been about family. And I imagine that you had to probably be pretty close with all of them. Well, I was very lucky. You know, I was a girl who just gotten out of Davis who wanted to make Cabernet for a living. That was my great. Uh, and I happened to do an internship here at Chimney Rock back in 1999 before the Trilados had become owners. Um, and shortly after I graduated, I'd been working in the, in the um, business for a little bit. Uh, the assistant winemaker here at Chimney Rock left in 2002, so I came in just as the Trilados were getting involved, and uh, Tony and I became very fast friends. I mean, he became one of my great mentors in, in life. You know, he was just, I mean, truly a wine legend and somebody that I learned so much from and somebody who supported me. Um, and, you know, the result of the friendship and, you know, seeing eye to eye with the family and what's important and growing great grapes for wine. Um, here I am 18 years later um, because I really respect their vision and their sort of relentless pursuit of quality. Fantastic. Um, and then 18 years in Napa and doing Cabernet, what would you say is the biggest shift in your style or has it shifted um you know just smelling it i love it because it actually seems a little restrained um there's a few out there that are almost you know i dare say port like and this is nice that it's actually reserved and doesn't taste like port so thank you yeah you know i think that's one of the marks of our style and it has been for a long time i will tell you i think napa's been through a journey where things maybe got a little too ripe um, and I think we've come back to center a little bit. And um, I've always been, and, you know, because I've worked with these vineyards for so long, I think I discovered very early on that nothing replaced the freshness of fruit that really, you know, 
getting overripe, you start to lose typicity of the grape. So um, I, I really am a kind of middle of the road gal. I really love finesse and I love freshness um, and power, but um, I, I think just, you know, I want to smell Cabernet in our, in our tabs. I think that's really important. Yeah, you know, one of the things I appreciate about this wine, and sometimes I've noticed some Napa winemakers hate this when I say it, but I think it's typical for Cabernet Sauvignon, is you get just a, a hint of very subtle herbaceous character, which for me is just a part of Cabernet. And for me, that comes through with, with mint, uh, with a touch of tobacco and sage that I find incredibly appealing. It balances out the fruit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Stag's Leap District, you know, we're nestled against the southeastern hills of Napa. So a little bit more influenced by the cooling breezes of San Pablo Bay. And I think, you know, it's interesting. We've got about 105 acres, 26 distinct blocks on our property. The north end is a little warmer and a little bit more south. You get a little bit of those old world characteristics and, you know, a little bay leaf, some mint, um, some dried herbs, which I really love. I think um, what's beautiful about Cabernet is when it's layered um, and not just jammy. And, and that's, that's what we try to tell, the tale of these vineyards in a very pure way. Um, Elizabeth, I'd be curious because the vineyards, it sounds like you're getting close to about 30, 40 years old on them. And I know the typical Bordeaux model, you'd be replanting. Um, what is your thought philosophy on that? Or, you know, is there plans? Have you talked about it? Have you thought about it? It's kind of a crazy thing because Napa, it's more celebrate old vines where Bordeaux, it's like every 30, 40 years, rip it out and replant for like the best Cabernet vineyards. Yeah, interestingly, we have approached it from a formulaic standpoint. We very much look at it block by block. So half of the property was replanted in the early 90s because of phylloxera. So those vines are about 30 years of age. When, when the Trilados pulled those last additional nine holes, um, those vines were planted 18 years ago. So we've got this really nice blend of old I would say older vines. Um, yeah. And honestly I I think there is something to older vines producing um, wines of power and depth. Uh, and I think unless you have issues from, you know, viral pressure to um, really maybe bad um, trunk diseases that vines can get over age, um, I see no need to pull them out. So as long as they're producing amazing fruit, um, you know, don't, don't mess with a great thing. Um, and we've, we've gone to great lengths in the vineyards. Uh, we use the Simonet and Cirque uh, pruning method, which really thinks about the longevity of the vine and the way that you prune vineyards. Um, so I think, you know, we're doing everything we can to make these babies live a really long, productive life. Great. And what are your thoughts on blending? Are we dealing with 100% Cabernet Sauvignon here, or are we uh, uh, throwing in some other Bordeaux grapes like Merlot, Cab Franc, Petit Verdot? Yeah, so we do have Petit Verdot, Cab Franc, and Merlot on the estate. And typically every vintage is a representation of what's best on the estate. So this is um, 23% Merlot and 2% Petit Verdot. Cabernet in 17 had quite a bit of muscle and really needed some rounding out. It was kind of a warm, concentrated, and really be kind of a time capsule to bring you back here in 2017. And you can close your eyes and imagine it was a warm year. And this wine is yeah. a reflection of that. Yeah, I mean, on the nose for me, it's just that classic cassis current. And it was great. I was like teaching a wine class the other day and someone's like, what is a current? And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, you know, it's like halfway between like, you know, a grape and a blueberry, but better than both in some sense. And this just has that like black current cassis. And then for me, I, I get your herbal note, Travis, but for me, it's almost going even a little bit more resiny to like rosemary which is kind of cool. And then I love too that there's just, I get that kind of plum note and I don't know if there's a good chunk of Merlot. I think you said this one was 75% cab, but I get that kind of plum chocolate thing, which I would associate with Merlot. And then deep below that's kind of this violet candied violet thing, which I would guess is probably the Petite Verdot, but it's a pretty nose and I love that each time I go back to it, there's more in there. Yeah, but I love you get it on the palate. You know right away that you're that you're dealing with great Napa Valley Cabernet, but it has a little bit of rockiness and a slight texture to it that, uh, again, 
I don't know if his power of suggestion just makes me think of Stag's Leap District, where you get that almost um, uh, almost uh, echoes of Bordeaux or something in it, where it's this uh, this mineral character. And then really great judicious use of oak here, too. So that little rich vanilla, that toastiness, which makes it so appealing when it's young, but is going to help carry all of the, the structure of the wine and those tannins as it begins to age. And, and uh, I love that about it. Yeah. And for me, it's crazy. It's got that little bit, if you're using the Bordeaux analogy, it's almost that pencil shaving going into floral. And it just, it reminds me of Margot. Like if I had to pick which commune in Bordeaux Stagley reminds me the most of, it's Margot. Oh, I totally agree. We've actually drawn that parallel. Margot. Oh, I totally agree. We've actually drawn that parallel quite a bit. So that's why that you see that. A little while ago, you used the metaphor of uh, of time travel or, or uh, wine being like the ability to travel back in time when you were talking about the 2017. Over your career, have you found, that, is there a sweet spot in terms of um, what age range you like most to drink these wines? Or, uh, um, or what do you think? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? Is it 15? You know, I think it depends on who you're drinking it with, what you're eating, what's the reason, what's the, and you know, that was one of the things that I, I learned from Tony. Every wine had an occasion and every meal was an occasion. So one of my fondest memories with him is just sitting around a table and there would be five magnificent bottles and he had a story about every one. Um, and there's a, there's a reverence, right, for um, that really thinking about wine. He had a story about every one, um, and there's a there's a reverence, right, for um, that really thinking about why is this bottle special right now. So my sweet spot, um, I, you know, I'm a winemaker, so I'm like hopelessly curious, and I tend to try things too soon. Um, but I love Cabernet in its eight to twelve uh, kind of year age because. Uh, you, you really get some of the primary characteristics, but you're re really starting to enter kind of that development phase. But look, there's nothing like opening, I think, sometimes a 25-year-old bottle or a 30-year-old bottle. And it's so moving because it's, you know, it's almost like a relic. And to be transported in time, I mean, I think that's really meaningful. So I think we should never let go of the idea of aging wines and selling them for a long time because that's a wonderful thing. But if if I were to say, you know, the prime stage to taste a wine with food and enjoy, I think with the Cabernet, I love kind of the eight to 12 year range. Thank you. And I love that, you know, the stories of Tony having like the kitchen and the table at the warehouse, you know, and that setting down and having lunch during business was significant and important. And we're, you know, really proud to offer a meal kit with these two bottles of wine, um, Caesar salad, and a couple steaks. So hopefully you can get together with some friends, pick up the bottles, the meal kit, and have a great dinner, make some memories of your own. Because ultimately for me, that's what wine's about, is when you can have that connection with great wines, great friends, and that's as good as it gets. Couldn't agree more. Elizabeth, one last question, because I know that you've done a lot with Stag Sleep and the AVA. Um, how would you sum up what makes Stag Sleep so special in Napa? I mean, because Napa itself is pretty special, but you're in kind of a, a really special part of it. So give us the Stag Sleep uh, elevator pitch, please. So, you know.